Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 398. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, coming to you right now from London, United Kingdom. I've been here for a week now. I was at the Master Series Trauma and Mental Health Conference that you heard me talking about a few weeks ago. It was quite an amazing experience, and I'm still digesting everything that happened. But I can tell you for sure that I made some amazing connections with some incredible people. And I'm not the same person I was before I left. Many adventures and I'm excited to tell you all about them. But right now, honestly, I'm just very wiped out. So I'm going to keep this brief because now I was in Oxford, UK. Now I'm in London for the Not Your Typical psychotherapist conference, which starts tomorrow. And Trauma Therapist Network is one of the sponsors. So I'm hoping that some of the attendees will learn about Trauma Therapist Network. And maybe maybe some of them will find that it could be a good place for them to come and connect with other therapists who care about practicing the way we talk about here on Therapy Chat. I will say this about the conference. I'll say more later when I have time to gather my thoughts. But what I will say now is that I see how important it is for us to keep doing what we're doing and spread the way that Therapy Chat talks about trauma and trauma healing. You know, one of the things that went on, well, let me start off by saying I was so fortunate to get to hang out with my friend Linda Ty who you've heard as a guest on Therapy Chat at least twice, and she will be on at least two more times because I already have those episodes recorded. I just haven't released them yet. Linda is a very special person, and it was interesting. I heard so many people just talking about how powerful her talks were and just how much they appreciated what she brought to the whole experience. Another person I was fortunate to spend time with was Dr. Jamie Marich, who you have heard me talking about a lot this year and will continue to hear me speaking about a lot. Jamie is really a thought leader in our field and shaking things up in a much needed way. And I think it was at the conference or maybe I saw it on Facebook before the conference. There's a well-known researcher on dissociative identity disorder who posted an article about, and I'm talking about like a peer-reviewed journal article, an academic journal article about dissociative identity disorder and research that was being suggested as ways to find out when people are pretending to have dissociative identity disorder. It's just so discouraging. That is not what we need. We don't need more shaming and blaming of people for their experiences. We need more listening to people's lived experiences and taking the, quote, expert role of the mental health clinician out of it. You know, we have expertise, but each person is the expert on their own lives. 
I say it all the time. I don't think my therapist knows me better than I know myself. So why would I think that I know my clients better than they know themselves? That's just so misguided and really I find it offensive. So the reason I brought that up is because Jamie commented on that person's post and just tried to educate them about the importance of listening to lived experience. But, you know, there's kind of a divide in our field and it's really, it can be discouraging. But in this case, I'm just using it as motivation to keep on doing what I'm doing and maybe be louder with my ideas that are a little bit out of the mainstream. So our guest today is not to say that I'm putting her, I don't want to, you know, without her permission or knowledge, put her in that same category. But Sarah Payton is a person who is bringing to light a lot of information that isn't in the mainstream of mental health. And this is a replay episode since I'm away, but it's, it's something that whether you are a therapist or not, I think what she talks about is very valuable. So Sarah Payton is a certified trainer of nonviolent communication, constellation facilitator, and neuroscience educator who integrates brain science and the use of resonant language to heal trauma and nourish self-warmth with exquisite gentleness. She teaches and lectures internationally and is the author of the book, Your Resonant Self, Guided Meditations and Exercises to Engage Your Brain's Capacity for Healing. And she has a second book from W.W. W. Norton, the Your Resonant Self Workbook, which came out in May 2021. I've probably said this before, but Sarah's work is the only thing that I've found that reached some of my clients who were really unable to access the felt sense of safe connection. And because of, for very good reasons, they needed to protect from trusting that connection could be possible due to experiences they had in the past where people who should have been safe deeply harmed them. And Sarah's work was a bridge to that. So if you are someone who uses CBT or if you are someone who has been a client who has worked with a therapist who uses CBT and not really found it helpful, you might find Sarah's work a nice add-on to what you're doing. It might help you get to where you're trying to go in your healing journey. Another thing along that line, I talked to someone, a gentleman I met on the train the other day from Oxford. It was yesterday. I'm so disoriented. Anyway, it was yesterday and we were talking on the train and he lives in England where wonderfully they have health insurance for everyone. But what's not so wonderful is that their healthcare system is seems pretty overwhelmed and has long, long waiting lists. So he told me how he has complex trauma and is waiting about a year and a half to get in with a specialist who can do a more intensive form of therapy after CBT wasn't, surprisingly, helpful. So I hope that he finds success with his therapist when he gets off that waiting list of a year and a half. And I hope that everyone learns that CBT can be beneficial when you're at a certain stage of healing. But when you're ready to do the deep trauma processing, you need a deeper form of therapy. So that's one of the reasons that Trauma Therapist Network is here is that therapists who may not typically incorporate bottom up methods can hear about them and learn about them from other therapists who are trained in them without having to go through a whole training and get tools and tips that you can incorporate in your own work. Of course, it's not a training community, but training is part of it. So it's really about connection and growing as a human and as a therapist. And I've probably mentioned it recently, but doors will be reopening at the end of September 2023. So if you're a therapist and you've been wanting to learn about Trauma Therapist Network or you've been considering joining, you can get on the waiting list now at the link in the show notes and you'll be able to join at the end of September. So I hope you will enjoy my conversation with Sarah Payton. She's very dear and I'm hoping to have her return soon. I'll tell you real quick. 
that at the trauma conference, I also talked with Deb Dana and asked her to come back. She, She's considering that. I also talked to Dr. Stephen Porges, who I will be interviewing later this month. He's the founder of Polyvagal Theory. and I'm excited about that. I talked to Dr. Peter Levine, the founder of Somatic Experiencing, and I asked him if he would consider being on. And I don't know if he's going to do it or not, but he does have a new book coming out that sounds like it would really be a great one to talk about on Therapy Chat. I think that all of you will be very interested in hearing from him. And so I hope he'll he'll come. But of course, I respect his choice. And I also spoke with a wonderful person who's doing a project, multiple projects to help children of war express through dance and another wonderful person who's doing peer-led grief groups that are really beneficial to people who are healing through grief journeys. So I made so many wonderful connections. Oh, by the way, I have to say hi to Jennifer Rosado, Jen Rosado, my friend who's a therapist, a trauma therapist in Texas who specializes in sexual trauma. And we spent a lot of time together. She's been a follower of Therapy Chat for a while and really supports the show so many ways. And it was so wonderful to meet her in person. So Jen, I know you'll hear this at some point. I don't know if you're going to be listening as soon as it comes out, but it was wonderful spending time with you. And I'm so glad that we got to be together. In fact, I was kind of hoping I could talk to Jen about her book, but Maybe hearing this will be the impetus for her to come on Therapy Chat and talk about it. I can't wait for her to share her work, too. We all have our different ways that we're making a difference. I think that was the biggest thing I took away from the conference was that we are all collectively making a difference and everything we are doing for the good of our planet and its beings is beneficial and is of value. And we must believe that we do make a difference and we can make a difference because without hope, you know, we got nothing. And without each other, we got nothing. So I'm going to go and have fun with a lot of wonderful therapists at this conference tomorrow. I know many of them are trauma therapists, so I'm excited to learn about them and their work. And to see Jessica Tapana from Simplified SEO, who I met, Last summer at the Group Practice Owners Summit in Chicago. Funny how you have to go to London to see someone who's from Missouri, but sometimes it's like that. So I hope that you're connecting. I hope that you're growing and learning and challenging yourself and healing and being gentle when when gentleness is needed and being fierce when fierceness is needed. And I'm going to keep doing the same. So thank you all for listening. Oh, I forgot the other thing is that on Friday, I get to meet in person with Pete. Pete, who is the editor of this podcast, he makes the sound turn out beautifully. And honestly, Pete gives me a pep talk almost every week when I'm overwhelmed, exhausted or discouraged. Pete always reminds me to keep swimming. So I can't wait to be with Pete in person in London because he lives here in the UK and we never get to be together. We've never been together in person, even though he's been he's been producing the podcast for about six years. So that's a very exciting thing I'm looking forward to. And I appreciate you all. I'm looking forward to bringing you a new episode. I think next week's episode will be a new one. I've got some really cool things in the vault waiting to be shared with you. One is a conversation with Robin Goebel of Big Baffling Behaviors. She has a book coming out later this month. And I think uh, I think that episode is going to come out on the around the same time her book comes out around the, the Friday, the week of the 18th. So somewhere around the 24th. So can't wait to share that with you. And much other goodness ahead. So thanks for listening and supporting. And if you like Therapy Chat, please tell a friend or like and subscribe on YouTube or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. All of those things 
help people find the podcast. And when more people find it, it grows. And so I think its impact grows. And I do think that it's meaningful. So I will talk with you all again soon. But in the meantime, be well. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and I'm very honored to be once again talking with a guest who's been on the podcast a couple times before. My guest today is Sarah Payton. Sarah, thanks so much for coming back to Therapy Chat today. I'm so glad to be here with you, Laura. I am too. I always get so much from our conversations and I hear so much positive feedback from my audience who can't get enough of what you're you're doing and just your your calm, peaceful presence is just so, so nice to hear. So I'm grateful for that. So let's let's start off for today with you giving our listeners just a little introduction to who you are and what you do for anyone who may not have heard our previous two interviews. Well, my name is Sarah Payton and what I do, what I love is to look at what is the newest brain research that shows us what brains do in relationship? And if we translate that information into layperson's language, then what does it give us in terms of leverage, understanding, self-compassion, and the healing of trauma? So that's, that's my kind of what I think about and walk through and write about and teach about. Uh, and and um and it's kind of where our worlds intersect in this wondering about therapy and relationships and how given that it's it's such a an invisible art the art of therapy how does learning about our brains give us any kind of purchase in this funny invisible and somewhat slippery world mm. Yeah, it's when I think probably when the average person hears the term neuroscience or, you know, brain research, it seems it seems like it could be pretty disconnected from feelings and relationships and our relationship with ourselves. But I've learned through you, through what you do, how much there's a neuroscience how our neuroscience really is influencing the way we feel about ourselves and the world and, and our relationships with other people. Yeah. Yeah. Both inside therapy and out of therapy. But what's, what's so interesting about humans and about the culture that we live in is that we kind of are given a constant message by our culture that we are individuals and that we, that we, that we are simply ourselves and that we really don't have very much relationship to the people around us or to our environment. And we get this message just starting so early that we need to take care of ourselves, that we are responsible for our own selves, that, that we can't count on others. And, and that's, of course, the very first hurdle for people when they're moving toward the idea that another human could maybe actually help them. So what I love to, to give people an understanding of is the almost visceral and cellular nature of our connections with other humans, that our nervous systems change radically depending on how other people are doing, that our sense of self around us, that our sense of self is created from the micro moments of connection, the moments when somebody actually sees us, someone actually understands us, the sense of uh, communion that we have with others can be so beautiful and so profound. And we may not even notice it because it can happen quite sneakily, like if we're both paying attention to the same TV show, we start to sync up. Or when we're listening to a speaker speak and that speaker is, is completing a sentence, we actually complete that speaker's sentence in our brain before they do. We are, we are very, very linked to each other. We're so linked to each other that the research of James A. Cohen shows us that if we measure people on their own without their community, their vital signs, all their, all their signs of effectiveness and self-regulation and 
and stress management and resilience are an immune system response, everything is lower than if we measure them in their community. We are community beings, but so many of us have had difficult experience with human community, of course, that we might not even believe it or we might feel suspicious or dis- or mistrustful even that I'm saying such a radical thing. But we are changed by and we become more truly ourselves when we get to be held in an atmosphere of warmth and affection. Mm. We become more truly ourselves when we are held in an atmosphere of warmth and connection. That that sounds like a point that I just feel I need to emphasize. <laughs> Yeah, it's the beautiful thing about therapy is that it 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 offers that opportunity. We can't always take our therapists up on the invitation, but it does it does offer us the opportunity, especially <laughs> I mean, people sometimes say to me, How do I find a good therapist? And I'm like, find somebody who really likes you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that experience of being really liked is is strangely transformative for many of us. Uncomfortable for many <laughs> of us, right? Yes, it can be so. Because it can feel so different. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, why does this person like me? I don't understand what there is about me even to be liked or to be likable. Yeah. That makes me think of clients who say, well, you get paid to like me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because it's like, you can't just like me. Right, right. That couldn't be right. Yeah, then that's such an intense moment for us as therapists. Like the experience of of mutuality, you know, is is a different experience than the experience of therapy. And sometimes I just want to say, yeah, but you're getting my full attention for 60 minutes. If, If we were not in this particular relationship, then you would have to be giving me attention too. Right. That's it. That's that's what the person is paying for is yeah. for the time that is focused only on them. Yeah. Yeah. And Which, where they don't have to do anything in response. They don't need to be focused on us. Yeah. It's different from relationships that are mutually um, reciprocal, which is what our normal human relationships is I think that's what makes therapy so unique and hard to explain and hard to understand when you haven't experienced it that it's about you and what you need and what you feel and what you want and and that is what our nervous systems I mean you can you're much more of an expert on neuroscience than I am so you can correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's like our nervous system our our attachment system within us needs to feel that it's our needs that matter, you know, in a certain stage of development. And when we don't get that enough, it impacts the way we see ourselves and who, how we, how we see the world and how we are in the world. Am I right about that? You're absolutely right about that. And the the payment makes it, does make it reciprocal. And there's something interesting, I think, when clients don't understand that that the payment is a part of the mutuality. But I'm not sure it's something, I, I certainly haven't found a way to speak about it yet, but I'm open to, to new possibilities of how to begin to talk about it. Just at this point, I think what I mostly do is acknowledge the difficulty of believing that we matter uh, if we're paying for somebody's time, that we, we don't we, that we have a hard time, but it's like, maybe there's something like, do you long to be loved for yourself, loved and experience someone being devoted to you and having a warm curiosity and generous imagination about you that would be, that would be a sweetness that was so great that it would fill the, the old hunger that you have within you. Be something like that would be nice to ask. Mm, those words. I <laughs> that's mm. what I mean. The way you are and the way you speak is so it's like almost poetic. Mm. And 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 sometimes I do think this is my poetry. I do think that because one of the things that research shows us is that poetry lights up the right hemisphere. Mm-hmm. And I often think about uh, therapy in a way sometimes as being 
uh, the poetry that somebody else writes about us, the, the words that we bring to our clients, our poems that begin to describe their experience. I had a, I was working with a therapist very recently and I, I started talking about something that was really intriguing to me. And he, he was my therapist. And I said, and, and he said, oh, I kind of want to follow that thought. But I know that that's illus illusion, illusionary, illusory. He said, I would like instead to just stay with you. I would like you to be the most sparkly thing in the room for me. <laughs> and that and that felt like a poem to me, you know, the the idea that I would be the most sparkly thing, that my thoughts wouldn't be the most sparkly thing, but that I would be the most sparkly thing. And that was a I just keep thinking about that moment. It delighted me so much. That's beautiful. And what you said right there, that word delighted was, you know, something that I thought of when you said some finding someone who likes you. Yeah. It's like we need as an attachment need, we need someone to be delighted to see us. Yes. Yes. To have warmth, to be moved by our existence. Yeah. I was struggling uh at one point with with how, how do I think about working as a, a having a client load and and I because I was feeling tired and I and I was getting a little supervision support for that and all of a sudden the image that came to me and it may have been brought by the person I was working with even was an image of my day being a river of love that was flowing through the 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 it's flowing through time through the boulders of the different clients like that each each client was stepping was stepping into the river of love and that was a very nourishing idea for me that really helped with a certain kind of sense of a, a daily grind it transformed it a little bit for me beautiful beautiful image yeah. can you say more about this statement that i emphasized before when you said becoming more of ourselves, can you talk about what you mean by more of ourselves? Yes. I love the work of Stephen Porges, who is the man who wrote the very intense book, Polyvagal Theory, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which is almost unreadable, but I did read it book way through it without being illuminated very much, except for I'm very illuminated by the theories of his work and, of course, by Deb Dana and her work almost interpreting him for uh, clients. I love, I love both of them very much and had them both on my uh, resonance summit really recently and got to do an interview with Stephen Porges, which I enjoyed. But well, what his work shows us is that we are, that when we have a sense of not being under threat from one another, when we have a sense, when our nervous system senses safety, which is a, a low bar for me. I always like to say that the nervous system is asking, am I safe? Do I matter? Does my voice matter? Are people curious about what I have to say? That that's an element of the nervous system, not just feeling safe, but knowing it's welcome. Sometimes I just want to change that nourishception of safety to nourishception of welcome. And so when we have a neuroception of welcome, when our nervous system senses that, yes, we are welcome, I'm on this podcast with Laura and Laura's happy that I'm here and I'm happy to be here and I'm glad to see Laura. Like we're giving each other a sense of the neuroception of welcome and that actually moves our nervous system out of fight, flight and alarmed aloneness into the experience of, of being more truly ourselves. We have more access to everything that's important in warm relationship when we have a neuroception of welcome. So our immune system shifts gears and starts producing the cells that fight cancer and that decrease inflammation. Our, our white, our red blood cells start picking up more more blood, more oxygen, like our our red blood cells begin to carry to our whole body a message of aliveness. And our our brain doesn't have to work on threats so we can access our full creativity. 
Our face becomes more mobile and engaged. We can hear the engagement in our voices. The muscles of the middle ear tighten to the sound range of the human voice. All of these things take us into what Stephen Porges calls social engagement. And in social engagement, we have our highest heart rate variability and our greatest capacity to respond to ourselves and to others. So one of the things you and I have talked about in the past, Laura, is the inner resonance and the sense of like having a warm curiosity about our own selves, bringing that same experience that we're talking about that happens in the very most wonderful therapy sessions of being held with warmth and enjoyment of being appreciated and liked and even sometimes loved. And this experience then of bringing that to our own selves, that we maybe even wake up in the morning going, oh, Sarah, welcome to the world. I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> mm. And this sense of moving into our lives and, and having our full capacity for nuance and imagination and creativity and relationships. So that's what I mean by being where we are more truly ourselves when we are like. Wow. Yeah. It's, it opens up all the possibility within us and within us to connect with other people. Yeah. And the things that kind of stop us, you know, if we're thinking about that moment in the therapy session where the client says, you only like me because I'm paying you. And, and if we kind of go into that moment for in, in detail, what we often find there is something that I call an unconscious contract. And this is the total, complete, dedicated subject of my, of my book that's coming out. Uh, it's published on May 25th. And it, it's, it's called the Your Resonant Self Workbook. But it's completely devoted to the idea that our nervous system's make agreements and contracts with us that we don't actually know about, that happen below the level of conscious awareness, that we make mistrust contracts, for example. So uh, the client who says, you only like me because I'm paying you, probably has a mistrust contract. Never to believe anyone that's saying that they are, that they like them in order to and there can be all kinds of in order tos. Some of the in order tos are 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 things like in order to make myself safe from future betrayals, with an acknowledgement that somebody misused affection for manipulation, for example, in the past. Or I will not believe that I'm likable in order to save myself from heartbreak and disappointment. And often that takes us directly into the traumas of living in a home where we just hoped and hoped and hoped for someone's love and it never came because of that own that person's own trauma and incapacity or we might have a contract not to like ourselves even in transgenerational sense like maybe our mom had a contract with herself not to like herself in order to explain the level of of violence and and uh, humiliation that she had to live through, and we don't want to leave her. So we might have a contract not to like ourselves in order to stay with our mothers. Or just recently, I, I, I tend to be a terrible workaholic. I just love my work so much. I discovered it when I was, um, my first book was published when I was 50. And so I have this sense of like, okay, I've got another good 10 years in me. What am I going to do? There's like this intense desire to do what, what, whatever is here to do. But I also had this sense that there was a puzzle for me in my workaholism, that there was something so driven in it. And I worked and worked on it. I was like, there must be an unconscious contract. And one year ago, I was actually sitting in my living room working on taxes and I thought, I am like a bee. I'm like a worker bee, a busy bee. I said, and I was just thinking, worker bee, worker bee. And then all of a sudden, what I realized was that my father, my father was a worker bee. And he died about 10 or 12 years ago. And, and I realized that if I just was a very intense worker bee, I could keep him with me. Like, that was my unconscious contract. If I just am the very best worker bee I can be, 
then I don't have to mourn my father's death and I don't have to miss him. And I'm just with him as I'm working so hard. And I'm kind of, I had tears spring out of my eyes in this moment of understanding. And, um, and then of course I asked myself, Sarah, is this a good contract for you? It's like, no, I can miss my dad. I'm, I'm big enough to be able to mourn his passing. I don't have to hide from it anymore. And I release you from this contract, Sarah, and I revoke this vow. And instead, I give you my blessing to explore rest and flow and a little freedom in relationship to this intense desire to work. So that's kind of a, a little micro view of, of this book that I've written. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that was, I was, I had some tears come up when you, when you shared that. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry for the loss of your dad. Thank you. So, you know, it makes me wonder, how do you identify these contracts? I know you do some family constellations and one of the ways that you work, am I right? Yes. And this actually, this form of thinking about contracts actually comes from the early work of Bert Hellinger, who is the founder of the constellation method. And in his very early days, he started to work in his later days, very non-verbally, very silently. But in his early days, he did say this. He did have people say, no matter the cost to myself. And that's a key part of understanding, you know, how strong our loyalties can be, that we don't even care, that I didn't even care that I was killing myself with my workaholism. And, and, and indeed, coming out of the workaholism, uh, I, I realized that there were multiple health issues that desperately needed my attention and that I really literally had been killing myself with the intensity of my drive and not really stopping to rest or breathe. So, so what we want to know is what are we doing no matter the cost to ourselves? And then that takes us into the world of being able to explore self-sabotage or to explore things like, you know, why don't I believe that my therapist is, has affection for me? Or, you know, what am I keeping myself safe from by never being on time? You know, because all of these little self-sabotaging habits that we do really seem to, we really seem to do them no matter the cost to ourselves. I will not exercise no matter the cost to myself. And the question, the part that's, we, that's the part we know. We know that we will not exercise, but we don't know what the unconscious part is. It's like the words in order to, which we've probably never put in. in we, we, we think of ourselves as kind of like finished products and that we're just flawed rather than saying, I will hurt myself in order to. And that in order to is a grammatical tool that lets us kind of open the door to the body and feel in to the body to find out what's my in order to, what am I looking, what am I looking to do? If this makes sense, if this thing that I just thought was a nonsensical flaw, if it makes actual sense, what kind of sense does it make? The Institute for Creative Mindfulness is the EMDR therapy training brainchild of Dr. Jamie Marich, a clinician and author and previous guest of Therapy Chat, who's on a mission to confront stigma around mental health, trauma, and dissociation. The Institute, informed by Jamie's work, teaches a somatic, expressive, bottom-up approach to EMDR therapy that does not treat dissociation like a dirty word. The Institute for Creative Mindfulness empowers its students to navigate dissociation as a normal response to trauma and stress when it shows up. Dr. Jamie Marich, who is out and proud on various levels about her own recovery, is a strong believer in the healing capacities of EMDR therapy and helping our clients to heal from the impact of trauma. She and her hand-selected team of faculty members will work with you to apply this modality in a practical and integrative way. In a special offer available to listeners of Therapy Chat Podcasts, you can use the code THERAPYCHAT to receive 15% off of any program offered by the Institute for Creative Mindfulness in 2023. This includes their EMDR therapy basic training programs 
and a wide variety of home study, advanced topics, and other CE offerings. Go to instituteforcreativemindfulness.com and use the code THERAPYCHAT, all caps, that's Therapy chat at Institute for Creative Mindfulness.com to save 15% off of any program in 2023. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Now that is very powerful. And it, it makes me think of when working with people who have trauma and it's the symptoms from the trauma that brings them to therapy, whether it's self-destructive behaviors, constant anxiety, depression, whatever it is, they always make sense. It always makes sense in the context of the person's experiences, why those are the behaviors or feelings that are driving them. And, you know, so by asking these exploratory questions of oneself, so interesting, like even the being late, it's like some people are constantly late. I think I can resonate with this one. It's like some people are constantly late and don't see themselves as someone who's constantly late, but just they are. Yes. I mean, I've been that way. And then there was a time where I began to become more aware that I had a habit or pattern of being late. And um, I know for me, I noticed that it's hard for me to leave the thing I was doing before, whatever it is. Like, interesting. Yeah. It's like there's something about... You know, you could call it like it's difficulty with transition, but in my story, um, it makes sense that it would be like not wanting to let go Mm. of whatever connection I had with whatever I was doing before. And, Mm. you know, that's if I look at it that way, it totally makes sense. Wow. Why I would be, you know, it's not that I don't want to be where I'm going next. It's that I don't want to leave where I was before. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of like I will not say goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. And I can definitely, I can know how that is in my, in my story so that there's still a lot to work with, but just even thinking about that understanding, something shifts. And it brings self-compassion. Mm-hmm. I often think that the therapist is the client's hippocampus. So if we think about what the amygdala does and what the hippocampus does, the hippocampus is the brain's organ that contextualizes and puts things into perspective and into both a linear timeline perspective and also into a meaning perspective. So so what happens in trauma is that the amygdala creates a flow of cortisol that actually short circuits the ability of the hippocampus to work. And when the hippocampus is short circuited, of course, it can't make any meaning out of what is what has happened. And it can't place things in context. So your realization of this larger context of the experience of being late, it's like your hippocampus is starting to speak to us. And we'll often hear clients do this in the therapy process. We'll hear them, we'll hear them saying, oh, and, and of course, they'll say, mm-hmm. of course I did this. Now I understand. Or they'll begin to, they'll move out of talking about the trauma. They've been talking about the trauma for 25 minutes. But finally, the, the resonance is, is perfect enough that the amygdala relaxes. And all of a sudden, we hear all kinds of meaning making. The, oh, yes, and my mother did this. And I, when I think about this, my sister did it. And, and this makes sense in terms of my family's uh, immigration from Ireland during the potato famine. 
And, you know, I mean, there's just so many ways that, that we feel and hear the picture that the, that the client is creating of their own understanding become more and more inclusive and, compa- and compassionate and, and expansive. Yeah. The space being made for that exploration within, I guess it's within that therapeutic relationship that is an environment of that whatever comes up is okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that kind of circles us, tucks us back into the polyvagal theory, the idea that there's an actual neuroception of safety below the level of conscious awareness that our nervous system is going, yes, indeed, everything is really okay to talk about and to bring here and to feel. Sarah, I'm thinking of something you said earlier, which I think might be a new phrase for some who are listening. And I've heard you mention it before, but I'd love if you could go more into it when you said our neuroception of safety and that we matter, mm. we're welcome, allows us to come out of fight or flight or alarmed aloneness. But can you talk about that? What that, alar- I think everybody knows what fight or flight is at this point, but what's the alarmed aloneness? Well, this is kind of a way to bring together the work of Yak Pongsep, who was, uh, who was looking at the circuits of emotion and motivation in the mammalian brain. And we, of course, being mammals, share these circuits with all of our other fellow mammals on Earth. And one of these circuits is the fear circuit. And we can be in sympathetic activation and be in the fear circuit. We can also be in sympathetic, we can also be in, in immobilization and, ha- and kind of be in frozen fear. And we can also be in social engagement and be able to say, oh, yes, I can tell I'm afraid. I, I, there's, there are edges of it. I'm not being taken over by it. I'm still able to make decisions, but I'm holding my inner scared self with a lot of care right now. So there are three ways of being for each of the circuits. And so then flight, fight, flight is the fear circuit. And if we think of fight as the anger circuit, where we can have immobilized anger or we can have anger in sympathetic activation, which is by far the most common, or we can have the life-serving anger where we're, we're really integrating our anger with our love. And we realize that the reason that we're so angry is because we love so deeply. It really changes the effect on the person that is experiencing us as angry. For example, if a child gets lost and then comes back and we're angry, you stupid child, what did you think you were doing wandering off like that? Or we can have a, an expression of the mix of anger and love that comes out explicitly. And we would say to the child, I, I, I'm i so angry and I was so scared and I love you so much and I want to be able to protect you and I just feel helpless when you wander off which is an entirely different experience of receiving somebody's emotion, much less of a burden because there's an an integration and it's a social engagement way of being able to express our anger. But there's also in our emotional circuits, there's a circuit that's devoted entirely to panic and grief, as as Pinksup called it. It's the circuit where sadness lives and sorrow and mourning and we're all familiar with that. And Pinksup also says it's our circuit where shame lives. But if we think about this circuit also as having three states, that there can be an immobilized grief or an immobilized shame or an immobilized loneliness. And then if we move up into sympathetic, sympathetic activation, this is the place that is so unusual for our culture to name As I travel around the world, more people say to me, the most useful thing that you have said to us is you've talked about alarmed aloneness, because it's not something that we we have a real solid name for. I'm the one who has coined this term, alarmed aloneness, to begin to invite people to notice that they actually really miss people and that the missing of people which creates a pining response or, or, or a missing response can be quite urgent. And indeed, in our, in our talking about the child who is lost, 
many parents have the alarmed aloneness experience of like, where is my little one? Where have they gone? My body cannot bear that they're missing. And there's elements of fear, but there's also, and there might be elements of anger, but there might just be this really pure sense of alarmed aloneness. I remember I felt this, I didn't have the words yet, but I felt this so strongly when I, when my husband got a new job that he left, we had to move three and a half hours away. And I had to move away from my older son who was, you know, already 21 at the time or something. So he was out on his own, but I had to live in a different city from him. And my nervous system was in an uproar and it wasn't fear and it wasn't anger. It was the uproar of missing someone who was very, very dear to me. And so as we begin to notice uh, our own capacity for having both sympathetic activation and a sense of aloneness at the same time, we can start to put our finger on a long time emotional experience, maybe a lifetime of a sense that, uh, of alarmed aloneness, something that could have happened, started when we were babies, where we were missing Missing the warmth and presence of our mothers, maybe she was traumatized, maybe she was having to work all the time, maybe she was distracted by illness, maybe she was taken by death, maybe she was taken by addiction or depression. And there's, there can be just an embedded sense in our nervous systems of this alarmed aloneness. And why is it important to have names for our emotions? Well, what we've seen from the work of Matthew Lieberman at UCLA is we've seen that the amygdala actually does not calm until the correct word is brought forward by the insula to be able to name emotional experience. And, and so it's, it, it's like it completes the circuit. The body gets to relax when we actually name the emotions that are true for us. And, and if we never have the word for it, if we never have had the words alarmed aloneness in our experience before, then our bodies may be carrying this ancient and important experience that has never been named. So we just kind of stay in that state of, uh, of what we can call anxiety that begins to calm and settle a bit once we start to have a word for the actual circuit that the experience is happening on. Wow. So I am I think I'm searching on one level. I understand what you're saying and I'm searching for knowing if I'm understanding it correctly, I think. Sure. I'm thinking about things like the first thing that came to mind, I don't want this to sound like I'm using this word in a with a negative connotation, but thinking of that feeling of a sense of desperation. Yes, and abandonment. Yeah. 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 So the way that we can become almost fixated on whether it's, for example, someone who suddenly feels that their partner is cheating on them and they just almost become convinced. Yeah without any real reason to think it, it suddenly yes. is true to them and they're determined to find the proof that it really is happening so that mm -hmm. because they just know it is like, yeah. is that kind of an example? I know it wouldn't be like just that, but is that kind of an example of it's what that? It's very much an example. Like? And what's so interesting about that kind of intense jealousy that takes us totally over is that it, 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 it the research shows that it, tends to have different manifestations depending on our attachment style. So for somebody who's avoidantly attached, then there will be a lot of sexual jealousy. So the sexuality circuit is involved as well and rage because uh, a sense of like that something very dear has been taken to, from us. And, and of course, there needs to be, well, for, for that particular manifestation of jealousy, we really need access to both uh, an understanding of how deeply we love and also uh, a little bit of access to the amount of grief that we feel and the loss, which takes us right into the alarmed aloneness. And if we're ambivalently attached, we tend to respond to this situation if somebody, if our partner is emotionally connected with somebody else, the same kind of rage and discomfort and Jealousy and pain and alarmed aloneness will happen not because of sexual connections, 
but rather because of emotional connections, which of course can be so enormously confusing to the people who are experiencing that sense of something very precious being taken from us because no sexual violation has happened. But it's very important to acknowledge that um, the emotional connections can be experienced as extremely threatening. And of course, the intensity of the emotion takes us into disorganization and traumatic attachment. And and it's so much uh, a response from our very earliest days and very much connected to the very earliest days experiences of unresolved alarm aloneness. Absolutely. Wow. So as we come to the close of our time together for now, um, I'm going to take a wild guess. I believe that your new book, and I know that your first book too, but this workbook may help people with working through this. But can you talk about how how can people work through this and what's in your book that could help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the very first and most helpful thing may already be happening on our call for people who are listening they may be starting to think, huh, I wonder what my unconscious contracts are. <laughs> and um, and and um, I said the other day, people people wish that unconscious contract work was the was the absolute end of the process, but it's not the treasure, it's the shovel to dig for the treasure. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the workbook provides a very grounded and clear introduction to the shovel of unconscious contract theory so that we get to dig in and we get to begin to find the treasure. And the treasure is actually the freedom that comes both with knowing that we have unconscious contracts and learning effective ways to release them. And we can, the the way that I found most effective is this kind of funny legal language, like I release you from this contract and I revoke this vow, seems to be like a way to acknowledge for the body that indeed there was an agreement that was in place. Sometimes people don't like the formality of the language and then we can experiment with things like, Sarah, you don't have to do this anymore. And you can see whether that feels like as as full a release as the, the, the legalese release. But the work takes people through step by step, connecting to all of different all of these different circuits that yak punks have discovered. And also like taking us into the idea that our nervous system itself can have contracts with us that are connected with Stephen Porges' theories of, of polyvagal and polyvagal healing. And so it's, a, it's really a very grounded uh, step-by-step exploration of what could there be? Why would it be there? What might be the deep reasons for it? And how can we release it? And what blessings do we want to give ourselves instead of these contracts? Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming here today again and and being with me and sharing your beautiful work. And I know that your website is a great resource for so many podcast interviews you've done and audio recordings that you've made and courses and trainings and webinars and all kinds of beautiful goodness. So what what is that and where where can people find you online? You can find me at www.sarahpayton.com and that has all the information. It's just a marvelous. My person who put together the website got really interested in the work and created a kind of an unfolding process of free material and material from the store and how it all fits together and what you might want to explore for different issues. So that's an, a resource. And then for the free guided meditations for both book one and book two, those are available on the, the yourresonantself.com website. Okay, uh, yourresonantself.com. Yeah. I'll put both of those in the show notes. And I, I'm just going to give a little tiny little testimonial about your free guided meditations that um, one example of how helpful they are is when I've shared them with so many clients and they, you know, people who really have trouble tapping into any sense of safety 
through, you know, I mean, other guided meditations and other resources that exist for that purpose. When sharing your guided meditations, people have told me that was the only thing that no part of me said, no, I can't, I can't relax into this. I can't feel safe. It's so. Wow, that brings tears to my eyes. Oh, I mean, I'm so grateful for these resources that you create. And I really want you to know that they are doing so much good for so many people. Thank you. Very grateful to know. So thank you again for being my guest on Therapy Chat again today. And thank you for having me. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached to see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.